Well, like I said, today we're in uh, our series, uh, Heaven, Who Goes There? And we're in part two. So if you were not a part of last week, you wish you could have been, but you weren't, uh, you're kind of uh, dropping right in the middle of uh, the movie. And so that you don't kind of get confused by the first part, because what we're talking about today builds on last week. What I want to do is kind of recap a little bit what we talked about last week. And I think that will help you out a lot. Now, what we discussed, if you remember, is that uh, Americans, almost every American, believes in an afterlife. They believe in what we would say is heaven. And most Americans believe that they are going to go there. Now, none of us want to get there too quickly, right? Uh, we want to take our time. Uh, we don't want it to happen like today, but we want to get there. And from that, we kind of came up with two different assumptions. The first one is, is that good people go to heaven. And the second one was that I am a good person. That good people go to heaven and I'm a good person. And when people die, they'll go to a good place and it just makes sense. Now, what kind of fuels this thinking for us are a few ideas. First of all, it's fair. I mean, if you're a good person, you should be able to go to a good place. You should be rewarded for the fact that you are so good. And good people here on earth should spend time in a good place called heaven for what they do, that that's their reward. Now, another reason uh, that kind of fuels this whole idea that uh, good people should go to heaven, uh, and I'm a good person, is that it's consistent with the notion of a good God. I mean, if God is a good God, then he wants to populate his good place called heaven with good people. A good God and good people are people that should be in heaven. It all kind of works. And then something that fuels this idea a little bit more is that every single one of you, when you look in the mirror, you make the cut because you are a good person. You're a very, very good person, especially compared to, and especially compared to, and you know, if you looked back, some of those people back there and up in the balcony, compared to them, you're not just a good person, you're an amazing person. And for those of you on the stream, you already know, I'm better than these people here that are at church today. I didn't even need to go today because I'm so good. Now, many of us just believe that thought that you make the cut, but... As we said last time, if you dig very deep into this whole idea that good people go to heaven and I'm a good person, it begins to kind of fall apart very quickly. Now, a couple of things that I want to touch on that kind of undermine this whole idea that good people go to heaven and I'm a good person, first of all, is this, that good is a moving target. Good is constantly moving. What a thousand years ago we thought was evil, maybe today we think's good. And a thousand years ago what they thought was good, now today we would say, oh, that's horrible, that's evil. We wouldn't do that at all. I mean, the truth is, is that good is a moving target. Historically, good changes all the time, depending on the generation. Culturally, it's a good kind of, uh, you know, it's a target that moves also. Good is different depending on what culture you're in. If you're in Sub-Saharan Africa or Europe or the United States or Australia, people have a different understanding of good than what maybe we think here in the U.S. and vice versa. Good really is a moving target. And then personally, it's 
uh, good moves also. Think about some of the things you did 20 years ago that you thought were so good. And now you're like, ah, that's not good at all. That's bad. For instance, when I was growing up, uh, we didn't wear seatbelts. Nobody wore seatbelts. What we would do is my mom would drive the car and if we had to slam on the brakes, that was the seatbelt. That was it. Now, back then we thought, oh, that's good. That is loving parenting. Now we would say that's bad. You'll kill your kid. Put on the seatbelt. Click it or ticket kind of thing. Now, you might be saying, uh, you know, kind of like this whole idea of whoa, 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 whoa. Chris, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I know one thing that will help us know the standard of goodness, and that is the Bible. Because the Bible tells us what is good and what's bad, what's right and what's evil. The Bible is the answer for all of that. And if you remember, last week we talked about the fact that the Old Testament really doesn't help us at all with that understanding. That what the Old Testament actually does is it tells you this. You don't make the cut. You don't make the cut at all. And the New Testament makes that even more of an idea. I mean, I'm not judging you, but if you want to say, well, I will make the Bible if I create that standard of my behavior, that'll get me into heaven. You won't make the cut and none of you will make the cut and nobody in the balcony is going to make the cut. You're just not that good, according to the Bible. Now, Paul, the guy who wrote close to half of the New Testament and is considered one of Jesus's closest followers, says this. There is no one righteous, not even what's the last word? One. Not a single human being is good enough. No one is right. No one is righteous. No one is good enough by keeping the laws, by attempting to be good, by keeping the rules. And then he goes on to say, all have sinned and fall short. How many have sinned? All. Every single one of us. Because if you sin in one small way, you sin in all. You fall short. Now again, I'm not trying to judge all of you good people because I know you think you're good. Uh, I'm just saying that when you pick up the New Testament, it is not a pretty picture at all. A lot of people say, well, the Old Testament, that. No, no, no but the good New Testament, it'll, it'll give us a picture of, of how we could be good. No, 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 no. And, and there's nothing in the New Testament that says that if you keep these certain rules or you follow these certain commandments, then you will go to heaven when you die. It's just not there. So if you're looking at this question, how good is good enough? How good is good enough? The Bible is no help whatsoever because we're just not that good. And finally, the clincher is kind of this, that if the Bible doesn't help us, if God doesn't tell us what we need to do to get to heaven, that he doesn't like give us a, a, a way of saying how good you have to be. Like, is it 75 percent good? Is it 50 percent good? Do we slide in if it's 25 percent good? If he doesn't tell us what we have to do in the midst of that, of what the rules are, what the list is, then from our understanding as human beings, and I hate to say it, but as human beings, we're like, well, God is not good. Because if God doesn't tell us what we have to do, then he's just toying with us. He's teasing us. He's moving the goalpost. And sometimes we don't even know where the goalposts are. And this kind of leads us to what I want to talk about today. And it's kind of the irony of all of this. And it's going to help us to rethink this whole idea that good people go to heaven, this whole thing. And it's this, this is your first fill in, is that 
Jesus did not teach that good people go to heaven. Jesus implied that bad people go to heaven. Jesus did not teach that good people go to heaven. Jesus actually implied that bad people go to heaven. You see, in the first century, the, the best people, the goodest of people, you might say. I know that's not a word. But the people who were like the very, very best, who kept all of the laws, were not good enough. This is why it's dangerous for you and I to take the Bible or the New Testament and open it up and say, well, if I just do these certain things, then I will actually be able to get to heaven. Because how do you figure out what that behavior is? It's just in the New Testament, it's all bad news. It's bad news. I mean, if you look at the teachings of Jesus Christ, what you'll find is that what Jesus did was he leveled the plain field. You see, in his most famous teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, what he actually did was he came and he raised the standard of good enough to such a level that everybody would fall short. He actually said, you've heard that it was said that this is the standard. But Jesus said, no, no, no. This actually is the standard. You've heard it said that this is how good you are to be. No, 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 no. You have to be this good. And he raised it so high that absolutely no one could meet the standard. And by the end of him doing this message, the disciples start looking around and they're like, dude, we have no hope. Like, we're in bad shape. We're going to hell. We're doomed. And when the disciples were thinking this after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does not come in to save the day and go, no, 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 no. You didn't understand what I was talking about. Uh, I, this is really what I meant. I think with kind of a grin, Jesus kind of walked in and he goes, yep, you're doomed. The Pharisees are doomed and the fishermen are doomed and the men are doomed and the women are doomed. Everybody is doomed. And he kind of had a little grin and he just kept on walking because Jesus was a master teacher to draw the audience in, to let them understand exactly what he was trying to say. And he did this all the time. And he turned the world upside down because he was the best teacher ever. You see, Jesus completely rejected the religious idea that you could be in good standing, you and God, while mistreating people that God loves. Jesus completely rejected the idea that it was just between you and God and that's all that mattered. And that was a showstopper. It was a game changer. Now, before we move on, I want to ask you a question and I want you all to answer it, but I don't want you to answer it out loud because the truth is I already know what the answer is. For you on the stream, if you want to shout it out loud, it's okay. But everybody in here, I don't want you to answer it out loud. And here is the question. Have you ever mistreated another person? Don't say it out loud. Have you ever mistreated another person? Maybe you said something, maybe you did something, maybe you thought something. Again, have you ever mistreated another person? Because that question kind of levels the playing field, doesn't it? I mean, could any of us stand up on this stage and say, no, I have never mistreated anybody else? I've never mistreated my mom, never mistreated my dad, never mistreated my sister, never mistreated my brother. I've never mistreated anyone at work before. I have never had bad thoughts toward a Democrat. I've never had bad thoughts toward a Republican. 
I've never had an angry moment towards somebody who was an independent, just wishy-washy. I've never been angry or upset with them. I've never lied. I've never gossiped. I've never talked behind someone else's back. The truth is, I have never mistreated anybody in my life. I've just never done it. And this is the general question that Jesus asked. Have you ever mistreated another person? Because if you have, you fall short. You fall short of the glory of God. And when Jesus did that, what happened was, he's like, all of y'all's guilty. Everybody is. You see, according to Jesus, this makes you and I a sinner. Anytime we mistreat another person, we sin. That is a definition of sin. When we mistreat someone that God loves. Now, let me talk to those of you who aren't a Christian right now, or you're just here because the family kind of twisted your arm, or you came for the very first time. This is what I want to ask you guys. Doesn't it irritate you when Christians who claim to be in a right relationship with God and are right with God, they say, I know God, I'm following God, I know Jesus, I love Jesus. Doesn't, you, doesn't it irritate you when they claim that and then they mistreat and they devalue people around you? Well, it should irritate you when Christians do that. I mean, it should irritate you because it irritated Jesus. It was something that he just had no patience for whatsoever. And if you're not a Christian, you can read the story of him being impatient with the religious types who would do this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first four books of the New Testament. You see, this is what Jesus taught. What Jesus taught is that when you sin against someone that God loves, you sin against God. When you sin against someone that God loves, you sin against God. Now, the easiest way, I think, for us to understand this, or at least for me, is if you look through the lens of a parent or a grandparent. And uh, I'll just kind of say uh, the, the way that I would say. If you mistreat one of my two daughters, uh, Jordan or Shiloh, don't come up asking for a favor from me. Don't come up and say, well, Chris, could you do da, 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 da. No way, no way, no how. It ain't happening. Because you got to make some things right first. You've got to change a little bit. If you want a right relationship with me, you can't have that and be mistreating my kids. It ain't going to work. And folks, this was a revolutionary perspective that Jesus had in the first century. Jesus said that that's the way that God looks down upon the world and views people and views you and views me. And that's his definition of sin. When you mistreat other people that I love. Sin isn't breaking some religious tradition or, or not being at church on one Sunday or, or keeping, you know, the religious tradition. It's all about the way that you treat people that God loves. So let me ask you again. Have you ever mistreated another person? If so, then from God's perspective... As presented through Jesus, you fall short of the goodness and the glory of God. And you and I and even most precious Aunt Louise, who never sins, who does nothing wrong at all, except, you know, every once in a while gets a little toke of a cigarette, even her. You're doomed. You're doomed. 
you're doomed, you're doomed, you balcony people, you're definitely doomed. And everybody on the stream, you're doomed too. We're all doomed because what happened was Jesus raised the standard too high. You see, folks, what religion says is, hey, all you have to do is be good with God. You and God, that's all that matters. That is the only thing that really matters. If you're good with God, everything is good. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I want you to look around. I want you to look around at every single person, even the person you can't stand. Look around them. How are you treating them? How are you loving them? How are you caring for them? How are you forgiving them? And if you're not, then you don't make the standard. And don't think for a minute that you can kind of mistreat other people and think that you're in a good relationship with me. It just doesn't work that way. So have you ever mistreated another person? And the answer is absolutely yes, we all have. And the truth is, because of that, we're all doomed. Aren't you glad that you came to church today? Aren't you glad that you're on the stream right now? Okay, so the bad news is we've all sinned. We all know it. That's the bad news, the really, really bad news. But the bad news, the bad news makes the good news even gooder, even gooder. Now, the word gospel actually means good news, And the reason it was called good news is because when Jesus showed up, he leveled the playing field for everybody. And now all of a sudden, the people who were hopeless and had a messed up past were like, whoa, you mean I'm good to go? Maybe that there's some hope for me because it's not just because I'm a bad person. You see, Jesus was the only person in history to offer a succinct and a clarifying answer to the question of how good is good enough. And are you ready for the answer? How good is good enough? It's offensive. It actually got him crucified in the first century. But this is what his answer was of how good is good enough. Right there. That's how good is good enough. This is what I know right now. You are not that good. And this is what I know right now. I am not that good. And he said that was the key to it all. That's why we needed a savior. We need this We don't need a list. We don't need an 11th commandment. We don't need some hoop to jump through. We don't need a work around, an excuse, a do over. It's what we need. It's what you need. It's what the world needs. This is what is called good news because it's not based upon you being good. It's based upon this. Him and him alone. Now, Paul, the guy who wrote close to half of the New Testament, he actually said that he was the most devout person to the law who ever walked planet Earth. I mean, when you think about people who kept every single law, and there were 613 of them, we'll talk about it next week, not all 613, but we'll talk about rule following next week that he actually was one that followed them all. He said, I did all of that. And when he came to Jesus, what he finally realized is in following him, that he said, I'm not good enough for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, including Paul said, who was, you know, a follower of him. He said, if you mistreat one other person, you fall away from keeping the law. And Paul said, I am the greatest of all the sinners. I am the chief among them. And so Paul goes on to say, this is what I ask of you. This is actually what Jesus desires of you. We beg you on behalf of Christ, 
be reconciled to God. That's it. You see, you and God don't fit. On your own, in your own goodness, you and God don't fit. We want you to fit. And you have a part in this. You have a role in this. You have to be reconciled to him. We want you to be right with God. We want a right relationship with him. But you've got to be reconciled. And so then you have to ask the question then, okay, Paul, well, how do we get reconciled with God? Like, how do we do that? Do we have to fly straighter? Do we have to work harder? Do we have to be gooder? Like, what is it that we have to do? And Paul said, no, 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 no. It's none of those things. And Paul goes on to say this. He says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That God made him who knew no sin which means Jesus never sinned to become sin on our behalf. So that we, that means all of us, everyone. He did it for you. He did it for me. What you could not do for yourself, Jesus did for you. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we would be made right with God. Paul's like, I wish I could explain it better. I wish I had different words, but I can't. This is what he's saying. That God, through Christ, gave us his righteousness. That God, through Christ, gave us a right standing. We can stand before God because of Christ. That he transferred onto Christ, onto him, all of the sin. All of yours, all of mine. And he didn't just take our place. This is what's so amazing. He didn't just take our place. Jesus gave us a brand new place. A brand new relationship. Not based upon the law or us being good enough. But based on something that we couldn't do because we all fall short. We mistreat people. But based upon only what Christ could do. Again, according to Jesus, folks, good people don't go to heaven because compared to him, there aren't any of us that are good. Good people don't go to heaven. Do you know what kind of people go to heaven? Forgiven people. Forgiven people go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And you know, maybe the most powerful moment in Scripture, maybe the most powerful moment in all of history, took place when Jesus was on the cross. He had already been arrested. He had already been beaten. He had already been flogged 39 times. It's where they take a whip and at the end of it, they place different pieces of bone or rock and they would... Uh, fling it onto a, a thief's back and they would pull it off. The term skinned alive, that's what flogging did. They knew 39 times was where a person wouldn't die. After 39, they knew at 40 they would die. Jesus took all of that. And then he gets nailed to a cross and there is blood that is pouring out all over him onto this cross. And in the midst of all that, he looks down and he says, Father, forgive. What's the last word? Who? Them. Father, forgive them. Father, don't hold your forgiveness back. Don't hold their sin against them and don't hold your forgiveness back. Don't make them pay for what they did. Father, forgive them. Folks, that's not just. That's not justice. That's not fair. That's not fairness. 
Do you know what that is? That's one word that's called grace. And this is what grace says. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you to, can do to make God love you less. God loves you as is. And that's not just good news, folks. That is the best of news. You see, religion will always tell you it's what you do. Do this and do that and do the other thing. But when Jesus came, he said, no, I'm tearing up that paradigm. I'm turning it upside down. Religion says do, Jesus says done. It's already been done for you. It's been done and done and done and done. It's done for you. And Jesus, the one who declared you a sinner, said, I'll take on your sin. Because on the cross, as he stretched out his arms, he said, this is how much I love you. Again, Paul reminds us of the good news by saying this, I want to remind you that the good news that I preach to you, that it doesn't matter how much you flubbed up, messed up, screwed up in this thing called life, whether it was last night or last year or 10 years ago or tomorrow or in the future, this is what you need to know, that Christ died for your sins, all your sins that he was buried, he didn't swoon, he didn't pretend, he was dead, no heartbeat, dead to the world. And three days later though, he was raised to life. And then he appeared to 500 different people, eyewitness accounts, even outside the Bible, that he was who he said he was. Then he ascended to heaven and folks, this is good news. This is amazing news. You're the bad news. I'm the bad news. And the bad news is that the playing field was leveled. The bad news is that you have mistreated people that God loves. The bad news is that you're a sinner and I'm a sinner and we're separate, separated from God. And then Jesus came and he declared it as much and he said, I came, I'll pay the penalty for their sin. Now, if you're like most people, you believe in heaven. If you're like most people, you believe that you're headed to heaven. And if you're like most people, you believe you're headed to heaven because of a certain reason based on something. So my question for you today is this, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Goodness, your good works. Goodness, we said, folks, is a moving target. It goes all over the place. Goodness is hard to nail down. Goodness is difficult to find. Goodness leaves yourself comparing yourself to somebody else that maybe I'm better than them, but I'm not as good as them. And you're not sure. But the good news, the good news of Jesus is that he invites you. He invites everyone, anyone and everyone who would turn to him. He invites you to transfer your trust on your goodness and what you can do to transfer that to his sacrificial death on a cross. Because what he did on the cross, you can't do for yourself. And he offers the gift of a right relationship with him now on earth as it is in heaven forever because he loves you. Now, my hunch is, is that for most of you, you know all or some of that story. But I have a feeling that for some of you, maybe today is the day where you're like, I get it now. It's not about doing all of these things. I'm always feeling guilty and I feel shame that I'm not doing enough. And today you're like, it's been done for me. There's a peace that comes with that. 
that I can transfer all of my sins, all of my mistakes onto him. I can transfer all the thoughts that I got to do my good works and everything. I give that all to him and a transfer of trust takes place. And this is the transfer of trust. I no longer choose to trust myself. I put all my trust in God. I transfer everything from me to trusting in him. I transfer my trust in myself. I transfer it to God. And maybe, just maybe, today is your day. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you so much for the gift of heaven. Thank you, Jesus, that you left from upstairs to come downstairs to have a relationship with us and taking on our sins and making us right with your heavenly Father. Thank you for your invitation to transfer our trust and our good deeds and our efforts to your sacrificial death for our sin. God, we want to be a part of your family. We want to know that we are fully loved, accepted, received by you. Now, maybe you're sitting there, you're on the stream right now, and there's a void in your life because your whole paradigm has changed today. You always thought that you had to do certain things, and now all of a sudden you're like, what? That's not it? It's what he's already done? That's what it is? And maybe today you're like, man, I want to make things right. I want to know I'll be in heaven with him. And it's not based upon my good works. It's based on what he's done. And when I know what he's done, I choose to want to follow him more and to be better and to understand him more. But it's not based upon what I do. It's based upon what he's already done. And if today's your day where you're like, I want that assurance, I want that presence, I want that peace in my life. I need his love, I need his grace, I need his forgiveness. I need the hope to be in him with heaven. Then I invite you in a prayer. And it's not a prayer that you pray by yourself, but it's one that we pray together, everyone on the stream as well, to just simply bow your head if you feel comfortable and to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, Thank you for loving me. I have mistreated people you love. I have sinned. I don't just need to do better. I need forgiveness. I need a savior. I accept Jesus as the savior of my life. I'm no longer trusting in my goodness. I'm trusting in you. I believe you died for my sins. Fill me with your spirit so I could know you, serve you, and follow you for the rest of my life. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.